King Mine, but its potentially environmental impact, or its potential environmental impact. But it's important to understand that the issue of mine drainage into the animals' watershed did not begin last month. The EPA was acting as an environmental firefighter when they went to the gold mine, Gold King Mine. They were attempting to damp down a raging environmental hazard that had endangered the animus watershed for decades. Unfortunately, when they opened an exploratory hole, the buildup of wastewater drainage was too much to effectively control. I hope that our witnesses, particularly Mayor Dean Brookie, the mayor of Durango, Colorado, located 50 miles downstream from the Gold King and hundreds of other inactive in mine sites, can help address both of the events leading up to the August 5th blowout at the Gold King Mine. The legacy of metal mining operations on the Animus watershed and, and useful next steps to consider in helping to prevent further environmental degradation in this truly beautiful region of our nation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, and I'll proceed to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is the Honorable Matthew Stanislaus, the Assistant Administrator for the EPA's Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response. Mr. Stanislaus was nominated and confirmed by the U.S. Senate for his current position at the EPA in 2009. He received his law degree from Chicago Kent Law School and a chemical engineering degree from City College of New York. Our next witness is Mr. Dennis Greeney, Managing Partner and President of Environmental Restoration, LLC. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Ecology from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign campus and did graduate work in environmental toxicology at Illinois State University. Our next witness is Dr. Donald Benn, the Executive Director of the Navajo Nation's Environmental Protection Agency. Dr. Ben received his PhD in chemistry from New Mexico State University. Our next witness is the Honorable Dean Brookie, the mayor of Durango, Colorado. He received his Bachelor's of Environmental Design and Master's of Architecture from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Our last witness is Dr. Mark Williamson, an environmental geochemist with over 25 years of experience. He has been involved in geochemical studies and site evaluations across the United States involving field, laboratory, and computational components. Dr. Williamson's background includes extensive work with acid mine drainage, metals in aquatic environments, geochemical engineering, and the fate and transport of chemicals in the environment. He holds a PhD from Virginia Tech, a master's degree from Northern Arizona University, and a bachelor's degree from Old Dominion University. Uh, we welcome you all, look forward to your testimony, and Mr. Stanislaus, would you uh, start us off? Sure. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. I am Matty Stanislaus, Assistant Administrator for U.S. EPA's Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response that is responsible for EPA's cleanup and emergency response program. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the Gold King Mine release and subsequent EPA response. Located within the watersheds of San Juan Mountains in southwestern Colorado are some 400 former mines, which were the focus of both large and small-scale mining operations for over 100 years. The Gold King Mine is located in the Upper Animus Watershed, which consists of three main streams, the Animus River, Cement Creek, and Mineral Creek. These mines have had a history of water seeps containing heavy metals and instability. In 1991, mining ceased at the last big mine in the region, Sunnyside. Subsequently, based on a permit issued by the state of Colorado, Sunnyside installed three bulkheads in the American Tunnel that drained its mine while continuing to treat the metal-laden waters draining into Upper Cement Creek through a water treatment facility. After Sunnyside installed the bulkheads in the American Tunnel, water seeped into natural fractures that allowed it to flow into the Gold King and Red and Bonita mines. Initially, these waters are run through a treatment system that Sunnyside built, but Gold King Mine Company ultimately stopped operating the treatment system. In 2008, the state of Colorado continued its efforts by constructing a water discharge diversion structure and reclamation plan to address the potential for increased water pressure within Gold King Mine. 
Based upon data from 2009 to 2014, flow data, the average annual water discharge from Gold King Mine and three nearby mines reach approximately 330 million gallons per year. At the request of local stakeholders for EPA involvement, by 2014, EPA joined the Colorado Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety to address both the potential for water buildup at the Gold King Mine and ongoing adverse water quality impacts caused by these large mine discharges into the Upper Animus watershed. Working with the state of Colorado and the Animus River Stakeholder Group, EPA developed plans to reduce potential mine water pressure and reduce mine discharges into Cement Creek and downstream waters. In 2014, initial work was performed at the Gold King Mine to relieve some water buildup. On August 5, 2015, EPA was conducting an investigation of the Gold King Mine. Work was underway to dewater the mine pool to allow reopening to assess mine conditions to characterize ongoing mine discharges and determine appropriate mine mitigation measures. While excavating above a mine opening, the lower portion of the bedrock crumbled and pressurized water of approximately 3 million gallons of water stored behind the collapsed material discharged into Cement Creek, a tributary of the Animus River. EPA and Colorado officials informed downstream jurisdictions within Colorado the day of the event and before the plume reached drinking water intakes and irrigation diversions. The following day, other downstream jurisdictions were notified again before the plume reached drinking water intakes and irrigation diversions. The notification warned downstream users so that drinking water intakes and agricultural intakes were able to be closed prior to downstream plume release reaching those intakes. However, broader notification should have occurred. I have issued a guidance memo to all 10 regions to work with state, tribal, and local partners to enhance our joint incident notification responsibility and processes. I understand the state of Colorado is doing, moving forward in the same vein. On August 26, 2015, EPA released its internal review summary report, which includes an assessment of the events and potential factors contributing to the gold mine incident. The internal review team found that the work plan accounted for the possibility of pressurized mine water conditions due to the history of blockages of the Gold King Mine, and the work plan identified steps to gradually lower the blockage and water buildup. The review team found that experienced professionals from the EPA and the state of Colorado concluded there was likely or no or, or low mine water pressure. However, given the release, there was in fact high enough water pressure to cause a blowout. The summary report concludes that an underestimation of water pressure inside the mine working was likely the most significant factor related to the release. The report indicates that site conditions made it difficult to indicate drilling to determine the pressure within uh, the mine. Now, I, I do have a lot more to, to talk about, but I'll take your questions to respond to those. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stanislaus and Mr. Greeny. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, uh, and other discussions. Make sure your mic is on there. Okay. Let me start it again. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, and other distinguished members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify on recent incidents at the Gold King Mine. My name is Dennis Graney. I serve as President and Managing Partner of Environmental Restoration and have served in that role since the company was founded in 1997. I've worked in the field of hazardous waste remediation and emergency response my entire career going back 30 years. We were one of the organizations involved in EPA's efforts at the Silverton site and we stand firmly behind our project management team and labor force there. That said, as professionals who have dedicated our entire careers to cleaning up the environment, the end result was, was heartbreaking, just to say the least. If I may, I'd like to give you a bit of background about our company. Environmental Restoration is an environmental remediation and response company that provides services to industry, commercial, and state, as well as federal agencies, and we're very passionate about our work. And we're very proud and honored to have provided services in some of our nation's largest responses, including the Deepwater Horizon, the aftermath of Tropical Storm Lee, Hurricanes Sandy, Irene, Katrina, and Rita, the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster, the 2001 anthrax response, both at the Hart Senate Office Building, as well as the Postal Services, and finally the 9-11 attacks in the World Trade Center. As a company, Environmental Restoration is committed to providing a safe work environment for our workers. That is our number one priority. 
it, we can demonstrate that through our experience modification rate, which is a 0.72 compared to an industry standard of one. We're nearly 30% safer than everyone else in our industry. As with many EPA environmental removal projects, we were one of several organizations with assigned roles at the Gold King Mine. For the Gold King, environmental restoration was issued a task order. Our task order requested us open the portal, which is the opening to the mine, as well as rehabilitate the mine opening to allow safe passage into the mine and then create safe access 75 feet into the mine tunnel. Within that task order, we had some sub-elements, which included a site preparation phase, which was construction of roads, staging areas, water retention and treatment ponds. Water management for water that was assumed to be put back behind some of the blockage within the mine, and again, the rehabilitation of the mine tunnel and opening up of the 75 foot of the mine tunnel. Data provided to environmental restoration indicated that we had to anticipate water approximately six feet deep on the backside of the blocked entrance within, within an approximate 10 foot tall mine. The gallons estimated behind that blockage was 250,000 gallons. As we now know, there were much more water behind the blocked mine entrance than experts believed. I was not personally involved or on the site when, it, when, when the release occurred. However, here's what I've learned. The release occurred during a preliminary trip to the mine and prior to environmental restoration initiating our work of opening the mine at it. During this preliminary trip, we were directed to remove rubble and debris that had caved in over the mine opening in effort to expose the bedrock above the mine tunnel. The removal of the material was carried out with all due caution over a two-day period and under the guidance of the EPA on-scene coordinator and abandoned mine representatives from the Colorado uh, Inactive Mine Program. The Gold King Mine release occurred following the removal and rubble from above the entrance. The Gold King Mine incident is a terrible misfortune for the Animus River and for all those who live along it and make their living from it. And it was really gut-wrenching to watch the after effects of the release. This in no way reflects who we are as a company. We're very proud of our track record. We've conducted 1,300 task orders for the US EPA, as well as over 10,000 other projects for industry uh, and commercial clients, as well as other federal agencies. Um, we're very grateful to have the opportunity to contribute to, to help safeguard people in the environment. And we hope to continue in that capacity for a long time. I'd like to thank you for your attention and time, and I'm open to answer questions to the best of my ability. Uh, thank you, Mr. Greeny and Dr. Ben. You know, Chairman Smith, ranking member and members of the committee, my name is Dr. Ben. I'm a chemist by trade, and, I, and I'm the executive director of the Navajo Nation uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on a matter that is of great importance to the Navajo Nation. On August 5, 2015, the United States, EPA, and other parties caused a massive release of toxic contaminants from the Gold King Mine. The toxic sludge flowed into the San Juan River and through 215 miles of the Navajo Nation's territory. The, the Navajo EPA had a close relationship and a good working relationship with EPA, with the U.S. EPA. However, recent events have shifted that relationship to one of uh, lack of trust. Today, I would like to cover only a few of the many critical areas of concern for the Navajo people. These issues and others are covered more extensively in my written remarks. First, the US EPA delayed notification of the spill to the Navajo Nation. The, na the nation was not informed of the release until August 6th. The US EPA also demonstrated a complete lack of transparency. The initial US EPA warning served to downplay the magnitude of the risk of human and animal health, and later reports uh, by US EPA were incomplete. Additionally, Navajo, the Navajo Nation expressed concern for the US EPA handing out and encouraging members of the Navajo Nation to fill out their standard for uh, Form 95 to ex expedite settlement of their claims. These in incident incidents have led to a culture of distrust by the Navajo Nation towards the US EPA among, both among our farmers and our leadership. I also want to lay out some of the devastating impacts of the Navajo Nation. However, I want to stress that all the impacts are yet unknown. First, families had the immediate impact of the additional cost of water delivery and other expenses to yet, exp uh, to, uh, despite this effort, they saw their crops dying each day. 
Second, the loss of crops and replacement of those crops, their seeds and feed for their livestock and other expenses triggers a cycle of long-term economic lo losses for a nation that has already uh, already has a 42% un unemployment rate. Third, uh, long-term health effects of the spill are unknown and not fully understood. Fourth, the Navajo Nation's cultural and spiritual impacts are felt mostly poignantly in the uh, disruption of our cultural principle of the uh, that encompasses beauty, order, and disharmony. In light of the devastating impacts from the spill, both known and unknown yet, um, we need to uh, act quickly and thoughtfully. We therefore ask for the following. Number one, we need resources to address the immediate emergency. This includes continued delivery of water and the delivery of hay to impacted ranchers. The EPA should also establish a relief fund for individual farmers, uh, ranchers and farmers. We also need true emergency response coordination with FEMA. Number two, we need resources to conduct our own water sediment and soil monitoring and the authority for Navajo EPA to do the necessary work. We propose to conduct these duties under the Navajo Nation as opposed to relying on the US EPA. I will, we will uh, require an on-site lab and additional staffing to manage the sampling and lab performance. Number three, we need assistance to create redundant and auxiliary uh, water supplies and reservoirs to guard against future contaminations. Number four, we will require funding, assistance, and resources to monitor, study, and address the long-term health and environmental effects of the spill and to return the river to its pre-spill state. Number five, due to U US EPA's conflict of interest, we seek to fare uh, an independent assessment of the US EPA's and others' roles in the spill and the establishment of a different lead agency. No other environmental bad actor will be given leeway to investigate itself and determine to what extent it will be held accountable. We believe other, another agency, such as FEMA, should take the lead on the response, and an independent body should conduct the investigation. Thank you for your time and attention to this important issue. I welcome any questions from your committee. Thank you, Dr. Ben and Mayor Bookie. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, and honorable members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I am Dean Brookie, Mayor of Durango, Colorado, a city of 18,000 residents at the base of the San Juan Mountains along the Animas River. I have lived, worked, and recreated in these mountains since, since 1980. Since its founding, our community has depended on the virtues of the natural environment as its lifeblood. Our mining her heritage is important, but our current economy is not dependent on mining, rather our mining history, outdoor recreation, the arts, other natural and cultural amenities. The August 5th mine waste release into the Animas River put a technicolor spotlight on the massive and complex century-old problem that our communities have lacked the resources to address. The fact is that three million gallons of acid mine water were released out of the Gold King mine that day. However, this is not just a one-time incident. About three million gallons of mine water drain out of the Gold King each week prior to and subsequent to this event. That is the quiet but real catastrophe that has largely gone unnoticed by the public until now. Our rivers are what bind us together as communities. The veins of the Animas River flow into other aquatic arteries of the West, including the San Juan River, which flows through the Ute Mountain and the Navajo Reservations, before reaching Lake Powell. From there, it joins the Colorado that flows through the Grand Canyon into Lake Mead, a water source for Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and San Diego. It is tempting in times of crisis to point fingers and place blame. After 130 years, thousands of mines, millions of individual actors, and literally billions of gallons of polluted water, attempts to blame single agencies or individuals ignore the scale and complexity of the problem that needs to be addressed. We must continue to work together at the local, state, and federal level and do much more quickly and with greater resolve to comprehensively address the water quality threats to our region before they result in far greater harm to our communities, as well as additional cost to government. The EPA must be held accountable for this accident. Every indication we have received from them shows that they are talk taking this incident seriously. There is no denying they had their hands on the shovel. But the EPA was at the Gold King Mine trying to help address these longstanding environmental issues. In fact, the blowout could have happened naturally the day before or any day in the future. 
Without the EPA, the federal government more broadly, and the federal government more broadly, there is simply no option for addressing the risk to human health and environment caused by the region's mining legacy. Yes, we can and should hold responsible parties in the mining industry accountable as well. Local, state, tribal governments, not-for-profits, and businesses also have a role to play. Fundamentally, though, our community needs, our community needs the scientific, technological, and financial leadership of the EPA to guide a collaborative process for addressing the broader problem. I see before us a watershed moment to turn a new chapter in mining history and protect our watersheds from Silverton to San Diego. I hope that the committee will join us to achieve a comprehensive science-based solution and will help to ensure that the EPA and other federal agencies have the resources and the clear direction needed to ensure the Gold King release is the last time we need to be reminded of this long-term problem before taking action. The City of Durango welcomes the committee's help to address risks and vulnerabilities posed by water pollution in the Animas River, including supporting the request of the EPA for over $50 million to build a new water treatment plant at Lake Nighthorse and create an important redundancy to our city's water supply. Responding to this event, a bipartisan coalition of four U.S. Senators and two congressmen has asked the administration to look at funding of a water treatment plant in Silverton as well. I encourage Congress to look at reforming the 1872 mining law that takes us from the 19th century into the 21st century and consider a royalty on mining companies, the same royalties currently paid by all other extractive industries that would be used for cleanup. Lastly, the Good Samaritan legislation proposed by Congressman Tipton, Bennett, and Udall during the last Congress could be an additional tool used towards long-term solution for cleaning up abandoned mines at less cost to government. With support from the EPA and Congress, I'm certain that we have the capacity to work together to develop an efficient, equitable, and scientifically sound approach to ensure the legacy that we leave our children is not one of accusation and rancor, but one of collaborative deliberation and action. Inaction will only allow this contamination to continue and result in continued impacts to our rivers, community, and all taxpayers. Please see my written testimony for more detailed information of the historical contest about the environmental impact of mining in the San Juan Mountains, cleanup, and the timelines of notification and follow-up activities by the EPA. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mayor Brookie and Dr. Williamson. Good morning, Chairman Smith, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, <clears throat> excuse me, and contribute what I may. My name is Mark Williamson. I am a geochemist living in Loveland, Colorado, and I earned my PhD from Virginia Tech in the Department of Geological Sciences. For the whole of my professional career and extending back into my graduate days, I have focused on the geochemistry of acid rock drainage, the type of solution discharged from the Gold King Mine, its management, and the associated issues of metals in aquatic and terrestrial environments. Consistent with the language in my invitation to this hearing, I am present to offer my education and experience to the committee in its examination of the circumstances surrounding the discharge of acid rock drainage, ARD, from the Gold King Mine. Like many of my fellow Coloradans, other professionals that work with ARD, and citizens concerned with the quality of our water resources, I was disturbed by the discharge from the Gold King Mine. ARD has a significant impact on water resources, negatively affecting thousands of miles of streams and rivers throughout the United States. To control, but not necessarily eliminate, the discharge of ARD from disused mines, uh, the engineered plugging of mine openings to regulate the flow has been a simple, relatively effective management technique, but the results, but results in a refilling of mine workings with water. At the Gold King Mine, Work plans from 2014 and 15 that I've been able to see uh, indicate that such refilling wasn't anticipated and that a potential blowout condition was deemed to exist at the collapsed Gold King mine portal, prompting the need for action. Despite the, fill the anticipated filling of the workings and the potential blowout condition, field operations at the Gold King mine used excavation equipment to dig open the collapsed mine portal. It is not clear to me that any investigations were conducted to assess how much water was present behind the collapse or if there was any water at all. Given the uncertainty, the potential negative consequences, and with the benefit of hindsight, a detailed assessment of the situation would have been advisable, but I am not aware of such documentation. 
any number of lines of investigation are familiar to me that may have been pursued, including drilling a borehole behind the collapse feature, inspecting the mine area for springs and seeps, searching for exploration boreholes that extend into the workings, reviewing and inspecting older mine maps for potential other openings, or as seems documented in the work plans of 2015, uh, inserting a pipe through the collapse feature to pierce it and check for the presence of water. Of these, a borehole behind the collapse and a pipe piercing the collapse can be used to pump out water to the extent that it is present in a controlled manner to remove the water and its associated risk. It is not clear to me from materials made public that any such investigation or evaluations were conducted. Without further documentation, it cannot be determined if site operations arbitrarily abandon a conceptual site model or if actual conditions uh, behind the dam led to a, bar or a paradigm shift. Given the ultimate outcome at the site and the lack of specific documentation, it appears that appropriate risk-reducing evaluations may not have been conducted. The resulting discharge of ARD from the Gold King mine uh, was comprised of an acidic metal-bearing solution as well as a metal-containing sludge. Both of these can and do result in negative effects on the quality of receiving streams. The solution phase can result in immediate acute impacts and the sludge acute impacts as well as more chronic conditions. Acute effects appear to have been temporal, largely avoided with the passing of the plume. The chronic long-term effects are undocumented and unclear at this time. In closing, I'll thank you again for the opportunity to be here and contribute and point out that managing ARD is very difficult especially in a historic mining district. Given the challenging conditions and the potential harm, care is warranted in pursuing remedial activities. Owing to the lack of available information, it is not clear just how much care was exercised in the Gold King situation. However, I am optimistic that we will learn the details of this unfortunate event so that such things can be successfully avoided in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williamson. Uh, before we go to questions, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Steve Pierce, who obviously has an interest in the subject at hand, and we welcome him to uh, the committee today. Uh, Mr. Stanislaus, let me direct my first question to you. On August 26, EPA Deputy Administrator Stan Myberg told reporters on a conference call that there was, quote, no evidence to suggest that precautionary measures were needed. However, I'd like to show you two documents on the screens. Uh, the first is a 2014 EPA task order, and the second is your own contractor's work plan from 2015. Both documents describe the potentially dangerous conditions at the mine, and specifically both state, and because the print is so small, I'll read it. Uh, on this PowerPoint, conditions may exist that could result in a blowout of the blockages and cause large volumes of contaminated mine waters and sediment from inside the mine, which contain concentrated heavy metals." End quote. Uh, I'd like to go to a second PowerPoint slide. And uh, this reads, this is from the internal EPA email that appears to address the potential dangers of the mine. The mine should be assumed to be full of water that is backed up to the top of the plug or higher. So my question, uh, Mr. Stanislaus, is this. Why did the EPA ignore uh, these obvious warnings? Well, for, for multiple of years, uh, both the state of Colorado, local stakeholders had identified the fact of water buildup, and the cave-in uh, situations. Right. So that's uh, even, that's, that even underlies my question even so more. So why were the warnings ignored? You, had, you were on notice for years. Yeah, so. And we saw the ranking member put slides up. We've had other spills. Why, why were the warnings ignored? Well, I, the warnings were not ignored. So it began with the identification of this particular segment. The reason why EPA was asked to be there was actually to address the water buildup and the cave-in situations. We specifically incorporate, I'd like to read it for you. Okay, but, but my, my question is, okay, if they weren't ignored, why did the incident occur? Sure. Why, uh, didn't, why didn't you take the precautionary steps that would have prevented the spill? Sure. Uh, so the, the, the work plan envisioned very specifically to carefully remove the, the, the rock buildup from the cave-ins and reduce uh, that water. The work that was being done at Gold King Mine was an assessment 
to identify what the particular circumstance existed at the Gold King mine. So uh, at this point- And you didn't we, think there was any danger at this mine? Uh, uh, well, clearly both EPA and the state of Colorado identified the risk uh, of a blowout. You know, right. This is built up because of a result of cave-ins over the years and water buildup. So th that is the reason why we were uh, up at that mine. So uh, what we know at this moment is the internal review concluded that this was identified up front, uh, the work plan uh, incorporated these careful measures. The experts of, of EPA and the state of Colorado looked mm -hmm. at the site conditions, looked at seeps, looked at flows, and concluded that there were a, a low pressure situation. Okay, then what went wrong if you knew there was a danger and you made the conscious decision to proceed, something went terribly wrong. Um, why did you proceed if you knew the dangers were so great, or were, did you proceed in some form of negligent fashion because clearly you didn't expect and didn't want this spill to occur? Sure. Again, none of us wanted the spill to occur. You know, the reason right. why we were there to avoid this blowout. The reason why we were there was to avoid that blowout. So wh what we were doing there was actually doing investigative work, and uh, per the work plan, we had the plan was to carefully reduce the buildup from the cave mine in, then to insert piping to reduce right. the I, I understand what you might have had planned. Again, something went terribly wrong. Um, it seems to me you did not heed the dangers, or you certainly did not act to prevent the uh, spill from occurring in an adequate fashion, or the spill would not have occurred. Um, do you feel that anyone was negligent at all? Uh, again, at this moment, what we have is an internal review we're awaiting the independent review being done by the Department of Interior okay. as well as to, the Office of Inspector General. And, we will await the right, completion and, of all of those right. to make that, and, that assessment. And to date, has anybody been held accountable or not? Well, we've held ourselves accountable. And most immediately, we've worked with the state and local communities to address the response. So we've been working in a unified way, collecting data, communicating right. that data to local stakeholders for, so they can make decisions. Right, that's all well and good, but still a tragic spill occurred. It looks like to many of us that no one's been held accountable. There had to be negligence or the spill wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have occurred, and yet the EPA doesn't seem to acknowledge any negligence. It doesn't seem to take any responsibility, and, and that's simply a, a disappointment, I have to tell you. Yeah. I have time for one more question. Let me direct it very quickly to Mr. Greeny and Dr. Williamson. Do you think that this toxic spill was inevitable? If you can answer yes or no, that would be good. Do you think the toxic spill was inevitable? I guess I'm not really qualified I thought he was gonna say no. from an assessment standpoint okay. on that mind to really to answer that question. Certainly there was buildup that would have gone somewhere at some point. But I don't I do not know if it would have resulted in a blow. Do you think that uh, okay. Uh, and Dr. Williamson? I would uh, ultimately like to rely on more detailed evaluations. However, I I wouldn't say that it's necessarily inevitable. It, it was in fact holding back quite a lot of water at this point, and there are other locations within the district that I'm aware of that act as opportunities for releasing pressure, so it's, it, it remains to be seen. It would have to be forecast with a little more certainty, I think. Okay, thank you all, and the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for her question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Stanislaus, how did EPA come to be involved with the efforts to address mine wastewater leakage at this uh, Gold King mine? It actually began when the American Tunnel got plugged. Uh, when, when it got plugged, and this is a permit issued by the state of Colorado with the Sunnyside Corporation, that plugging resulted in the water increasing up to the Red and Bonita mine and then the Gold King mine. Subsequently, water seeps went into uh, Cement Creek and Animus River, the stakeholders then asked EPA, uh, along with the state of Colorado, to get involved to address that risk of water flow into the Animus River as well as uh, the cave-ins at the Gold King Mine. Now, I've heard that the installation of the last bulkhead of the, at the American Tunnel in 2002 may have been a superseding cause uh, to the blowout on August 5th. Can you please describe the history of the closure and the plugging 
of the American Tunnel and what its relationship might be to August 5th blowout at the Gold King Mine? Yeah, uh, we EPA was not directly involved in that decision. What we do know from the internal review that was conducted was that a permit was issued by the state of Colorado to Sunnyside Mine that plugged uh, the mine, you know. And um, as uh, Dr. Williamson uh, noted, that once you plug a mine, you will have water backup. And what we do know is the water backed up to the Red and Bonita Mine, which is a mine right on top of that, and then migrated out to the Gold King Mine, which then subsequently led to the water releases to Cement Creek and to the Animus River. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Brookie, and th thank you for your testimony and, and your characterization of the um, technicolor spotlight that had been placed on the, on the problems facing your constituents and others for decades, if not longer. While I understand that the mining played an important role in economic development of the Western United States, the impacts of abandoned mines are difficult to ignore. You note in your written testimony that mine blowouts like the one on August 5th are not uncommon. Putting this most recent release in context, could you describe some of the past challenges your region has had to deal with as a result of mining activities? Certainly. Uh, you know, we have, uh, since the 1880s, uh, downstream users have grappled with related pollution in the Animas River, River as a result of acid mine drainage uh, because in 1980, the, the mines just dumped this directly into the river. And it was, and uh, by the 1890s, the Animas River that ran through the uh, Durango was, ran gray and turbid. It was a quote in the Durango Herald from 1890. Nearly every day, thanks to mill tailings being dumped into the river near Silverton. This is approximately 55 miles away. Back in 1890, our town was covered with gray, turbid Animus River. Uh, it was not the clear river that we have today. In 1902, Durango shifted its primary water source, potable water source. This is uh, from the Animus River to the Florida River, a tributary that adjacent if it comes from another uh, uh, watershed that's, that has less mining activity. So back as far ago as 1902, we changed our water source, our primary water source. We still use in the summertime the Animus River for uh, uh, that goes through our treatment facility and it uh, meets water quality standards after being treated. But it's primarily only used in the summertime for uh, irrigation of uh, a number of the fields and lawns and so forth. Our water requirement uh, increases by fourfold in the summertime. Uh, in 1930s, the farmers along the beautiful Animus River Valley north of Durango uh, threatened to sue the mining companies uh, to curtail their tailings. Um, took legal action against the mine because the, uh, the tailings were clogging their ditches, similarly to what the Navajo Nation is experiencing today. Uh, the mine blowouts, like the uh, uh, 1975, a huge tailing pond br busted, uh, sending uh, 50 thousand tons of tailings into the animus, turning it the color of aluminum paint. This was just prior to my arrival in Durango, and the people were still talking about this release. And if you can imagine, you pick a color. This was gray. It didn't show up on, uh, on, on TV as uh, bright as orange, technicolor orange, but uh, uh, we had the same thing happen in 1975. 1978, there was a huge burst of uh, tens of millions of gallons of water and sludge came down our river. At this time, it was black all the way to Black River, all the way to Farmington. So pick your color. These are 24 different types of minerals that have impacted our, our, our river, our watershed, flowing all the way through Durango into New Mexico, into Arizona, and into ultimately the Colorado River. Um, the, uh, the Gold King mine was draining anywhere from 200 to 500 gallons per minute prior to the blowout. And uh, so there was, th you know, if you can envision this mountain as a, you know, uh, a giant geologic whack-a-mole. You plug one mine at it, as has been discussed here today, and you build up the pressure of water. These are tunnels and c vertical columns. They fill up with water naturally. And when these people are exploring the opportunity to release that somehow nat uh, and, and, and contain it, uh, there was an accident. And so that 
is, is estimated at 60 feet of water that created that three million dollar three million gallon release that impacted us it happened to be orange that day because the orange oxide that's probably the least uh, health critical element that was released the color did however bring national attention to this issue um, we've had black we've had gray we've had all kinds of colors last year in the spring there was a release of more than uh, a greater release than was experienced in the Gold King, but it happened during the spring runoff in 2014. Came down our very same river. We didn't even know it. The Navajos didn't know it. Nobody knew it because it happened to be in the normal uh, turbid brown color spring runoff that occurred and it came through our town. That's what happens and that's what we have to deal with. Okay, um, uh, Mayor, thank you for that response. We let you go a little bit over time, but uh, that was interesting. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I was listening to the statements and answers to the questions um, here today, I kind of heard a common theme as I've, I've read the reports of this, uh, this event is it's not important for us to find out who's to blame right now, but other than to clean up this bill. It's understandable. <laughs> but it seems to be when the government is at fault, they're not very anxious to figure out who's at fault, but if it's somebody else, we're more than willing to point the blame, even during while the disaster and the cleanup is going on. Let me, let me bring attention to 2010, the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Disastrous. It was disastrous to the people of that region. It cost many people their jobs. Many businesses went under because of this. Even while we were attempting to clean it up, the government didn't hesitate to go ahead and point fingers as to who was to blame. In fact, the uh, former EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson, and the Secretary of Homeland Security, then Janet Napolitano, sent a scathing letter to BP um, saying they must be more transparent with what happened. Dr. Ben, has, in your opinion, the EPA been transparent with what's going on so far? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Well, uh, as far as the uh, farmers and the ranchers are concerned, um, they hadn't really been as transparent. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stanislaus, I appreciate you saying we're, in summarize, eventually we're going to get to what the issue is. But why are we only being transparent when this committee goes forward and demands answers? Why is not the EPA coming more aggressively right now and, and and coming out with what was the cause and what are we going to do to fix the situation? When are we going to see the transparency that this government demands of private industry or individuals when they're clearly at fault? Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, we believe we've been as transparent as we possibly could. Our initial focus was absolutely to collect the data and provide data in the hands of uh, local communities of the states and tribes to make decisions. Subsequent to that, we posted about 2,500 pages of documents, documents regarding the work plan, documents regarding uh, the request proposal, uh, documents regarding community meetings held with stakeholders, and we will continue to do so. Now, with respect to holding ourselves accountable, you know, we first began with immediately and as aggressively as is possible to conduct a response in a unified way, uh, making sure that the state and local government and tribes are part of the unified command. Clearly, we are only part of the way through. We've done an internal review because I was very interested what lessons learned relate to other sites around the country and what lessons learned in terms of what transpired there. But that's only part of the puzzle. Have, have we, you been more transparent than BP was? Have I been more transparent? I think we've been very transparent. I've not done the comparison, but having been involved in the BP spill as well, and I believe we, ha we in fact, pushed uh, transparency there, uh, and I believe we, we uh, executed the same level of transparency here. Ultimately, who's going to be held responsible for this? Well, that is exactly where we are in the process of, uh, of, of, of examining. You know, we've done an internal review. We have two other independent reviews, and we will see the culmination of that regarding what were the preparation and facts going into that event, how was that executed, uh, and we're going to look at all of that. But so do you agree that there. you should be held to the same standards that you hold everyone else to? Absolutely. you agree to that? Absolutely. After the Deep Horizon spill, President Obama appeared on the Today Show in 2010 and stated, 
Mr. Hayward has been had Mr. Hayward, the president and CEO of BP, had been working for him, he would have already been fired because of his role in the spill. Do you think we should hold the same standards? Should well, Gina McCarthy well, already, should we have called for her to be fired if definitely the EPA is responsible for this spill? Well, I think we all want a fact-driven process. So we've done one step of the investigation. We await the independent review, and I think all the members, all the public have also called for independent reviews. We're going to see the culmination of that. You know, roughly, I mean, we've had the Department of Interior is doing a study in 60 days. I don't recall exactly when the Office of Inspector General will be completing. Because we want a fact-driven process, both to, because I'm responsible for the cleanup of contaminated sites around the country at the request of states and local government. I'm more than anyone else. Want to know? Want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So and we are going to await that information. I appreciate that. We're running out of time. All I'm asking for is that the hypocrisy of this government hold it stop, mm -hmm. and that the government hold itself to the same standards that it holds the American people to. And that's what I think we must demand as we go forward. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Okay, thank you, Mr. Latterman. By the way, I don't remember President Obama waiting for an independent review, given the comments you just said. Uh, the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, is recognized for her questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, there's absolutely no question that what happened uh, in Colorado is, is tragic. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here to help us learn more about why it happened, if and how it could have been prevented, to critique the response uh, of the EPA and how that was handled, and also talk about the lessons learned. Uh, we also have to keep in mind that there are inherent environmental damages and or, or dangers from metal mining operations, and that there are thousands of inactive mines around the country that are consistently leaking toxic wastewater full of heavy metals into streams, creeks, and rivers. So we, we need the Environmental Protection Agency to review the uh, mining development to make sure that mining operations do not endanger crucial watersheds. And, and I want to also talk about the need to be proactive here and, and mention Pebble Mine uh, in Alaska. Uh, EPA watershed assessment found that Pebble Mine would likely have an irreversible negative impact on the local watershed and salmon fisheries. Congressman McDermott and I led a group of our Oregon and Washington colleagues asking the EPA to protect Bristol Bay. Uh, fisheries in that region provide thousands of jobs and millions of dollars uh, annually to the economies, not only of Alaska, but also Oregon, Washington, and the entire Northwest. And the potential uh, damage from a massive mine operation is a serious threat. And I hope that the lessons learned in Colorado are considered uh, in that ongoing process. But back to Colorado. Mr. Stanislaus, you said in your testimony that based on 2009 to 2014 flow data, the average annual water discharge from Gold King Mine and the three nearby mines reached approximately 330 million gallons per year. And the EPA and the state of Colorado and partners have been taking action to address that issue. So can you please talk about the ongoing, those ongoing discharges and the work that was being done there. And in your response, uh, please address whether additional resources would have made a difference. And also, uh, would a Superfund designation or listing uh, of the Gold King Mine have affected the resources or, and the approach uh, available for cleanup and remediation? And I, and I do want to save time for one more question. Sure. Uh, so most recently, uh, the animus stakeholder group and the state of Colorado asked for EPA's assistance, both from a funding and technical expertise. That's what brought us to the mine, uh, the Red and Bonita and uh, the Gold King Mine. But there was a pre-existing effort by the animus stakeholder group who identified, uh, uh, Congresswoman, the, the multiple sources into the river that degrades the water quality. In fact, about 10 miles by the animus river is degraded and fish uh, uh, health is severely uh, uh, compromised. So just last week, at the request of local communities, I actually traveled uh, to Silverton to have a community meeting about uh, whether a listing of Superfund uh, would uh, address this issue. We're in the middle of that conversation. Um, and I presented that uh, to be eligible for Superfund resources, they have to be listed on the national priorities list, and we're going to engage the local community regarding that. And Mayor Brookie, I want to ask you to follow up on that. I, I represent a district in 
Oregon and really Im understand the importance of preserving uh, natural resources. Uh, and that's especially important to um, our tourism industry, which I know you share those concerns as well. So can you talk about how this recent release, which of course we all watched on television, some of you up close firsthand, how has it been treated in the media? Can you talk about what the coverage has done to your local economy? And also address the Superfund designation, because I know that's a, a discussion that's been ongoing in your community. Sure, surely. Uh, well, and I might add that uh, 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 Ms. Gina McCarthy was in Durango, took full responsibility for uh, the EPA's role in this event. Uh, she wasn't at a, it was a plastic table and a metal folding chair, closer than the chairman and myself sitting together, and she took full responsibility. I did get a phone call the Thursday after the event from Sean McGrath, who's the Division 8 EPA director, asking the, from the city's perspective if we need any assistance uh, at all. Uh, from this event, and that was, uh, and by the way, we were notified within an hour and a half at City Hall of the release. The event happened at uh, about 10.58, we were notified at 1.39 in the afternoon, and that allowed us to shut down our, our pump stations out of the Animus River, protect our potable water supply. And, and can I just ask you who notified you? Um, well, if the uh, Colorado Department of Health and Public, uh, Public Health and Environment, CDPHE, which is the uh, appropriate protocol from EPA to notify the state health department. They notify downstream parties, which we were notified within an hour and a half. And then could you briefly address the effect on tourism that you've seen? Sure. Well, as you can, might imagine, I found myself in uh, with a barrage of cameras, everybody from Al Jazeera to Fox News Channel, uh, uh, holding press conferences, et cetera, and infinitely showing uh, the, uh, the orange plume coming through our town. It's still on screen. It's good to see it again. I can tell you that orange plume no longer exists in Durango. It lasted for about a day and a half um, and before it moved on to our friends downstream at the Navajo Nation. <laughs> but uh, um, it, we, we are, we immediately closed Mayor, the river. Mayor Brookie, we've again run out of time. My time has expired. And uh, appreciate okay. your, your response. Sure. Uh, we'll go now to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Abraham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first let me express my, uh, I guess, awe at uh, the Secretary of the EPA actually not being here. Uh, we all know in this room that if it had been a, an individual business, uh, that business would have been vilified way, way before this. So I find it somewhat uh, unconscionable that uh, Ms. McCarthy uh, chose not to be present uh, at this hearing. Saying that, uh, Ms. Stanislaus, uh, you said in your testimony that your experts at the EPA underestimated the water pressure. Now, I'm not a hydrologist, but I can certainly uh, estimate water pressure pretty easily with, a, with, with certain equipment. I've done it on my farm many, many times. I guess my question is, if they underestimated this, have they underestimate, underestimated water pressure at other mines? I'm talking to you, Mr. Stanlaus. So, uh, so, so j j just to be clear, uh, I mean, I, I am here because my responsibility is emergency response. Yes, sir, I understand you're the cleanup okay. man. You're fourth uh, in the lineup, so as, as far as batters are yeah, concerned, yeah. and really this should, you shouldn't even be here because it should have happened in the first place. You wouldn't even have a, a role in this. So I, my question uh, to you is your experts at EPA, you have said in your testimony, underestimated the water pressure. Well, no. Have they done this in other places? So the, the pressure w was not estimated. You know, what the, re the review report concluded is that when they got onto the site, they identified the potential for blowout conditions. When they and got was, onto the. Uh, and let me interrupt, excuse me, sir, with due respect. Mr. Greenlee, with you and Mr. Stanilos there, if y'all knew that there was an issue here of potential blowout, was there a mitigation plan in place for this potential disaster? The blowout potential, as it was identified following the, the, the issuance of the task order and, and some initial site work, again, represented there was six foot of water behind that bulkhead. I'm sorry, not bulkhead, the, the collapsed tunnel. Um, the intent then of the work plan was was essentially to come in using that top four foot of open space between the water level and the... But what, did line. you have a mitigation plan in place for this potential blowout? 
Indeed. because you knew it was a potential thing to happen. I mean, yep. we all have mitigation plans in life for certain instances that can happen, and this is what the definition of a mitigation plan actually is. Did you have one in your company? We had a management plan to, again, use the, a, a, pr a probe, much as uh, Dr. Williamson had suggested, to, to insert into the well or into the mine and start pumping water. So that was your mitigation plan. If it started to blow, you were just going to pump water out. I guess we're, I'm, 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 I'm not sure you're using mitigation. I'm using a management plan. You're looking for a contingency plan? Yes. Let's, 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 let's agree on that word. If, if it happened, what was your immediate first step, and did that happen? There, again, the, the blowout occurred during the initial... We, we had not started our site work. We were not prepared okay. to enter the, the, the added... That answers time. the question. You weren't, you weren't there. Okay. And uh, Mayor Brookie, you said that the EPA, the, the good news that day was that the EPA was actually there when it happened. And, uh, you know, I would use the analogy in medicine that uh, a surgeon working on a lung slices a heart open, and we're glad that surgeon just happened to be there because he sliced a heart open. So, you know, I, again, it just uh, is beyond pale that, uh, you know, we're at this point where we have to have this hearing because nobody, like uh, the chairman said, there is there is totally a lack of transparency and an, I, tr I think a, a lack of uh, forthrightfulness here. Uh, Mr. Stanilaus, has EPA estimated the uh, actual money cost to the environmental impact on this uh, spill? Well, at this moment, we've expended about $8 million of direct response cost. And how about uh, referring to uh, Mr. Ben, as far as the Navajos, uh, what he's asking for, have you have you factored that cost into your figures? Well, we have begun to pay a uh, response cost uh, by uh, those who have asked local governments. We're going to continue to provide those response costs separately. Uh, we've established a claims process under the Federal Talk Claims Act. Um, we're going to be uh, working through that process and completing the process within six months. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abraham. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, is recognized for his questions. Push that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome my fellow Coloradans to, uh, uh, to Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. All of you, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, part of this is I feel like, you know, we're in the early stages of litigation, and I, the chairman, I think, may be a frustrated litigator wanting to figure out who was negligent, who wasn't negligent, who's responsible for this, what happened. I, I appreciate the fact that the EPA got to the Department of Health uh, in Colorado quickly, who got to Durango quickly to share this. There apparently was some breakdown in communication getting to the Navajo Nation. So. In all of this, a court is going to figure out exactly what happened, why it happened, when it happened, should it have happened, Dr. Williamson. So, but I'd like to ask some, some other questions, because I think, uh, Dr. Ben, you suggested some things that the EPA should consider in the short term and in the long term. Uh, those, I, if, if I recall correctly, one was, you know, help you with some monitoring devices to keep an eye on things, help the the farmers and the ranchers who may have been impacted. Am, am I right about that? Yes, sir. Are those conversations ongoing with the EPA at this point, or are you guys in litigation, or where are you? Right now, we're still in discussion. You're in discussions. Okay, so yes. there is some conversation going on mm -hmm. between, you, between the Navajo Nation and the United States of America through its EPA. There's only discussion among uh, uh, us as a nation right now. Yes. Oh, within your within the own, your own nation, you're not talking to the EPA. Yes, sir. Okay, I asked that badly. Um, so, you're is the nation speaking to the EPA about potential ways that the EPA and the United States could help the nation? As I explained to the U.S. EPA at one point, that this uh, whole situation can't be tackled all at once that there's three parts there's the spill the reaction to the spill and the coordination the uh, collaboration with epa um, we're actually in that stage right now um, not i think that um, 
they are uh, working with us, um, but to a certain degree. Okay. Uh, let's, if I could, I'd like to have a couple, the first slide uh, showing exactly where this Gold King mine is. Can we put that up on the board? So, no, the other one, sorry. This. That one, yes, thank you. So, Mayor Brookie, Dr. Williamson, can you describe the area where this Gold King mine is and approximately how many mines are in the Silverton complex, which I think, you know, range at least in the hundreds, if not into the thousands. Dr. Williamson? In response to your first point, uh, the, the terrain is mountainous for sure, uh, southern, uh, southwestern Colorado. It, it's a mining district that's fairly dispersed and widespread, and there are uh, multiple historic operations in the area. An exact number I, I couldn't really tell you. And approximately when did the mining start in this, in this area? Perhaps 130 years ago, give or take. And, and uh, Mayor Brookie, do you know how many mines are up in that district, up in the complex above uh, Durango? Uh, in my written testimony, I have a little diagram of the mines. Uh, there's, there's hundreds of mines in and around that, the, the, uh, that particular basin, uh, as well as in, uh, that's just Cement Creek. Uh, then there is also, as been mentioned before, Mineral Creek and the other side of the mountain is the Animus River, uh, primary tributary. They all feed into the Animus River as they come through Durango. But in that basin, there's, uh, there's, there's virtually, uh, uh, in all there's over 5,000 mine shafts at its tunnels and prospects in the upper Animus drainage. And in Colorado, we have many more than just in this area. I actually represented an engineering company years ago in another troubled mine with a big release that the EPA got in and we you know, built some new treatment facilities and the like. So can we go to that other picture that was up there for a moment of exactly where this gold king mine is and the terrain right there? So the other one. <laughs> there we go. So in preparing for this, um, this had been, there had been a release, there had been a slow leakage, if you will, in a couple hundred gallons per minute as opposed to three million gallons in a very short period. Um, but over time, there's a lot of uh, liquid release, there was a lot of liquid release from this mine. And, and Mayor Brookie, I think you said like 300 million gallons per year or something like that. So That's correct. just for illustrative purposes, Three million gallons, which was released uh, in that August 5th and August 6th time frame, versus 300 million gallons uh, per year. So we have a lot of work to be done with a lot of mines in the state of Colorado. And my question is, if the EPA or some federal agency doesn't help with this, who does? Dr. Stan or Mr. Stanislaus. So we are called to address Superfund mining sites around the country. That's only a small subset of, uh, of mines. Uh, so we get involved in, and do the work that we've been doing on this and other mines around the country. Clearly there are, I mean, just in Colorado, I believe there are 23,000 23, mines <laughs> just in Colorado. Uh, you know, the hundreds of thousands of mines around the country and that responsibility is split between other federal agencies and, and states. Mr. Greeny. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. Your time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for his questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could I get the first slide, please? Mr. Stanislaus, uh, this is the public website where EPA has been releasing information about the Gold King mine spill, including videos captured by EPA contractors that show the blowout as it happens. According to the website, and I want you to look over on the far right-hand side there, uh, EPA removed profanity contained in the audio of the videos and obscured visible license plates for privacy purposes. And then it ends with this. EPA did not edit the videos in any other way. So first question for you, Mr. Stanislaus, is the statement I just read from EPA's website accurate? It is accurate. Okay, great. 
Do you have any reason to believe that it would not be accurate? I do not. Okay. Here is video footage of the early stages of the Gold King mine blowout that was obtained by uh, the Science Committee. Let's have video number one. We're digging really high. Is he going to go close it out? Well, the next video is the exact same footage that EPA posted on its website, uh, but the last few seconds of the audio has been removed to prevent the viewers from hearing the team on the ground saying, what do we do now? Let's have the second video. So, you said that you had no reason to believe that uh, the EPA's, EPA's website had been, uh, had been uh, altered. Um, I've just given you reason because the evidence is there, the, the before video and the one that you posted on the website. Um, why did the EPA edit out the audio of the team on the ground saying, what do we do now? You got any idea? I, I do not, you know, and, I, and EPA provided uh, it's 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 so okay. Based. That's good enough. After seeing both videos, do you think EPA's website is misleading to the American public? I can't tell uh, at this moment. What do you mean you I, can't tell? I, I, I would, you I, just saw two videos: one that had it, one that didn't, one that was that was clear and open, one that was posted by the EPA. How can you not tell? I would need to compare that all the You just got a comparison, all, Mr. Stanislaus. All, all the circumstances beyond the two videos and what the, okay. the various staff and EPA... Uh, the EPA apparently had an on-scene coordinator on the ground during the spill. Is that correct? Do you have any idea? Is the EPA on-scene coordinator the one in the video who says, what do we do now? I, I don't know that information at this moment. Okay. Um, EPA did not release videos of the incident for over a month after the spill, a month. How long did EPA know about video footage of the incident before it disclosed the videos to Congress and the American people? You have any yeah, idea? Yeah, my understanding was the video was provided as soon as possible. And I don't, know the, well, I, I don't know exactly when EPA obtained access to the video and the time period. We can get back to okay. you regarding the time frame. All right. Uh, Mr. Stanislaus, this is another video of the spill after the toxic water was moving more rapidly. Let's go to video number three. So if the EPA had known the answer to the question in the previous video, what do we do now? Is it possible the EPA's response would have been better and prevented the water from escaping the mine so quickly? Could they have stopped this rush that we just saw? Well, all I know at this moment is what is contained in the internal review. And what the internal review concluded that uh, the risk of a blowout was identified as possible by both the state of Colorado EPA that was discussed with the animus stakeholder. Okay, group. good. I, I appreciate it. Hold on to that. Hold on to that statement right there. So given that the risk was identified, EPA had every reason to believe that a blowout was possible. Was the EPA prepared to properly respond to an environmental event of this magnitude? Well, uh, again, that's an easy, that's an easy answer because yeah, we yeah. got 3 million sure, gallons sure. of toxic water Sure. that ran into the river. Sure. Were they were they adequately prepared? Yeah. So because of that risk... Yes or no? Well, I need to answer that question. Because of that risk, they put in place specific plans... Okay, but it in, didn't, they didn't execute their plans. Well, if I can separate. So in the work planning, so the whole, whole point was to carefully remove the rock buildup and then remove the water. This part of the investigation phase. 
The investigation team also concluded that the emergency response component of the plan did not include the worst case scenario of a blowout, and that's something that I committed to going forward to make sure that happens. Well, according to news reports, the EPA failed to notify local officials, including the Navajo Nation, for 24 hours after the spill. They did not have a plan to deal with an environmental event of this magnitude. And clearly, what do we do now? That question they didn't have an answer to. Mr. Chairman, I got lots more that I could talk about, but my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byers, is recognized for his question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with, uh, with respect and in the spirit of fairness, I do want to say that I object to the pejorative and accusatory title of the hearing, holding the EPA accountable for polluting Western waters. I think it's been very clear from the testimony today that the EPA was very far from being the first mover in the release of the heavy metal laid mine wastewater. And it's an untenable stretch to say that the EPA is solely responsible for this spill. Mr. Member, it makes no sense to compare Deepwater Horizon to this spill. There's tens of thousands, perhaps millions of difference in, in order of size and impact. The EPA was only at the site because it was concerned about the decades-long problem of contaminated wastewater release. And blaming the EPA for the larger problem of the wastewater release is like blaming firefighters for the forest fire. Three million gallons were released on August 5th. As we've heard today, three million gallons are released every week, year in and year out. I've been very concerned about what Dr. Ben has talked about his impact on the Navajo Nation. I like to think about the larger impact of the Navajo Nation about all those gray releases and black releases and others that Mayor Brookie talked about. And on the call for accountability, we've already heard that the EPA has done, has released 2,500 pages up on the internet. And I've yet to hear any resistance from Mr. Stanislaus about not being willing to come forward with all the transparency that is requested. And yet to hear a description um, of what the EPA is somehow withholding. Um, you know, we want to hold people responsible, but uh, it seems to me that they're doing their best to come forward. Um, we, two years ago, Peter Butler, the coordinator of the Animus River Stakeholders Group, appeared in a video that highlighted the history of the mines in that region. I'd like to ask that that video be shown now. I'm Peter Butler with the Animus River Stakeholders Group, one of the co-coordinators. And we're here at the uh, Red and Bonita Mine, which is up in Upper Cement Creek. The Red and Bonita Mine, back in about uh, 2000, only put out maybe 15, 17 gallons per minute of acid mine drainage, which was not very heavily uh, metal laden. And now we have a drainage of around 300 gallons per minute. Uh, and it's loaded with metals. And you can see it coming down the, the, the dump pile here in front of us. Uh, back in uh, 1996, a uh, bulkhead was put in the American Tunnel, and then later, in about 2002, there were two more bulkheads put in the American Tunnel farther out near the surface. It was all part of a consent decree, uh, an agreement between the uh, mining company and the state of Colorado regulators. And uh, at the time, that uh, raised the water table, and it's believed that because there's a higher water table, that's why we have all this drainage now coming out of the Red and Bonita. And uh, this is untreated drainage. It flows into the cement creek and goes on down into the animus. Uh, and we can track and see the increase in metal loading from this site and three others all the way down to Baker's Bridge. How many miles away do you think? Probably about 45, 50 miles downstream. Do you think it's had any effect on the aquatic life think, in the animus? It's clearly these the, the four sites up here, this is the biggest amount of water, the biggest flow, but the four sites up here have clearly impacted the Animus River down in the Animus Canyon. Uh, we've done fish surveys and we've done uh, bug analysis down in the canyon from Cascade Creek up to Elk Park and clearly there's been a major decline in the number of species and the amount of species of both the macroinvertebrates and trout species. The American Tunnel used to drain about 1,600 gallons per minute. Uh, the American Tunnel was an access to the Sunnyside Mine, which is by far the largest mine in the Silverton area. That uh, The mining company stopped mining in 1991 and uh, they were treating that 1,600 gallons per minute and doing a good job of it uh, up until uh, this consent decree. They entered into the consent decree, whereas they were allowed to put bulkheads into the American Tunnel 
And then they did a number of other projects throughout the uh, Animus Basin to try to reduce metals to offset any seeps or springs that might pop out because of the bulkheading of the tunnel. They, uh, back in 2002, they had uh, fulfilled the agreements of the consent decree and the state signed off on it. Uh, after that, probably around 2003, 2004, we started seeing a lot more drainage coming out of some of these mines up here in Upper Cement Creek. The four main mines that we've seen drainage increases, well, we've always, all, there's always some residual out of the American Tunnel. And then there's also increased drainages coming out of the Red and Bonita, which is here, the uh, Gold King Number no. 7 level, and the Mogul Mine. Altogether, the increase in drainage uh, varies a little bit the time of year, but it's about 600 to 800 gallons per minute of acid mine drainage, which is untreated. That's probably the largest amount of untreated acid mine drainage in the state of Colorado at this time. Almost anywhere else that has that much of a drainage has a treatment plant on it. Uh, we're undergoing efforts to try to figure out a solution for a cooperative solution to try to uh, mitigate and reduce the amount of metals coming out of these drainages. Uh, this area uh, potentially could be a super fun site uh, the, the EPA thinks it has the criteria but uh, there's not a lot of local support for a super fun site uh, therefore we're doing this collaborative process instead of going a regulatory process at this time Mr. chairman thank you for letting me go a few seconds over <laughs> Now you don't have any time for questions, though. That's the problem. <laughs> Just point out that that video was done in 2013, two years before the EPA spill. Right. EPA had plenty of notice of the dangers of mine spillage, and I thank the gentleman for pointing that out. Do you have a question? We'll make uh, acknowledge you for another extra 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Byer. Uh, the gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Comstock. No. I'm sorry. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Westerman, is recognized for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Greeny, I have with me a copy of the uh, action work plan. It says uh, the, on the title, it's Environmental Restoration LLC. Who prepared this document? Uh, that is traditionally prepared by our response manager assigned to the project. Okay, so how many layers of approval did this document go through? That document would be basically a collaborated effort between the on-scene coordinator from the US EPA as well as the, the response manager. And those two, the, the OSC, the on-scene coordinator, would traditionally sign off on it as, as accepted. So you, somebody from your company signed off on it and somebody from the EPA the, signed off? The response manager from our company as well as the US EPA on-scene coordinator. So were professional services employed by engineers, geologists, or hydrologists uh, used in preparation of this work plan? No, that would have been any data that we, we, we work off of the data that is provided to us within the task order as well as any other data that's provided by the federal on-scene coordinator at the time of the, of the task order. We are not an engineering firm. Data is provided to us by the agency. But this is clearly engineering top work, so who, who was qualified to prepare this plan? The engineering component of our task order would have been the actual structural uh, design and installation of the entranceway to the mine as well as the, the, uh, the, the completion of the, the, the tunnel work, and that would have been subcontracted to a specialized subcontractor who was, basic, or who was already on contract and ready for us to, to initiate the work. So a professional engineer subcontractor prepared? No, no, we, we prepared that plan, and then there was a subcontractor to us who, would, who came in subsequent to that plan to do the engineering design and installation of the, the, the portal restoration work after, the, after that plan was submitted. So were there engineering design documents, drawings, or specifications? I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that. As far as the actual construction phase of that, I don't know. So were you involved in this project? No, not, not directly, no. So would it, would it not be normal practice if somebody's out doing the work that they would have the plans and the specifications the work plan, again, it's more of a timing issue, I believe. That plan would have been turned in within, say, 30 or 30 days or so, 60 days, and I don't, and it varies depending on what the, the federal OSC wants. And it's the preliminary approach. The way our contracts work is we're giving a, 
you know, a set of technical directions, and then we define an operational approach to meet that technical direction. So that was a plan saying, here's how we're going to get there. It mentions that we're going to hire a competent contractor to do that work, but it doesn't define who because it hasn't been procured yet. Yeah, it, it doesn't say anything about hiring anybody for professional services. It does talk about uh, subcontractors. Uh, this document was provided um, for, for transparency purposes on the EPA website, and it's got uh, it lists three attachments that weren't included in the document, which I think would be pertinent uh, to the document. The first one is the cost estimate. What was the total cost of this, uh, this project? I do not have that information. I can certainly get it for you. And then the schedule wasn't included. Do you know um, the time frame of the schedule? I, 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 I believe the, the schedule, the safety plan, and the cost were the three attachments. And my understanding was we did turn those over, minus the cost was redacted for confidentiality reasons. But I think that's pertinent to the to the issue and that my question is was there adequate cost and adequate time allowed to do this job properly? There, there was certainly the, the cost and, and, and schedule provided to do the, the project as was originally understood, yes. So why would that be redacted out of the document? For con the, the, the cost itself was unit cost that was part of our contract and that was confidential business information that was redacted. And also not included in the document is the uh, site health and safety plan. Was there a site health and safety plan? And the, yes, there is. And, and again, it was my understanding that it was released. I, I, I don't understand why you didn't have their access to it. Okay, so we really, we're really not sure about how much design engineering was done on this, this project and if the people who approved the uh, the work plan were qualified to to approve that because there was obviously a, um, a lack of planning that went into this because of the the spill that occurred. But Ms. Mr. Stanislaus, is there a uh, is this common practice? Is what common practice to prepare these plans without professional services? Well, clearly there's a whole sequence of beginning with the request for proposal, which identified the specific circumstance and risk that then goes into a work plan, then then goes a construction plan and execution plan. You know, what the review team found was the expertise both at the state of Colorado, EPA, and the contractor, but the right expertise for the mining expertise was in place. They had uh, planned to execute that, and, and the review report goes through how that report, how the plan uh, was executed. Most laws, most states have laws that say you can't do this type of work without a professional in charge of the work. So does EPA exempt uh, following state laws on, on professional services for these type projects? Well, all the appropriate professionals uh, for this job, you know, the, the our review team found that the expertise for doing a job like that was in place. Uh, in, on this project team, uh, both the EPA and the state of Colorado and the contract. And the gentleman's time has expired. And the gentleman from California, Mr. Takano, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to get back to proportionality. Three million, three million gallons in one and a half days was visible as orange oxide in uh, the water uh, four miles adjacent to this mine. But 300 million gallons, I understand, flow of waste uh, that wasn't visible, was not captured uh, in the visual. And that's why we have this visual to make this comparison. So it's a matter of proportionality. I find it curious that this committee is focusing on this and spending hours and hours and hours of time trying to figure out uh, in, the, in the wrong venue. It should be a court of law figuring out the liability. And we're jumping to conclusions in this, and the title of this hearing is even jumping to a conclusion, uh, which, you know, is misleading. When we should be talking about this. And in the spirit of that, I would like to yield more time, my time, to the gentleman from Colorado to, to continue his questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Takano. If the committee would allow me to go forward. Absolutely. I, would the gentleman, would Mr. Takano yield just for a minute? 
or for a couple of seconds. I can't wait to use the gentleman's arguments the next time a private company dumps millions of gallons of toxic water into a pure river. And uh, thank you for yielding, and the gentleman from Colorado will be recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think Congressman Beyer, Congressman Takano have really hit on the key point here, which is, as Dr. Williamson said, we've got thousands of mines in Colorado, many abandoned, many properly closed, with all sorts of issues. And at some point, we've got to address them. We've had, you know, lakes collapse into mine shafts, causing huge releases down the Animas River and into the San Juan and into the Navajo Nation. So let's just go back to basics here. So the EPA started working on this, at least with the stakeholder group and with its professionals in 2014, did it not, Mr. Stanislaus? Yeah, slightly before 2014, yeah, right on. So you worked with affected individuals uh, to try to figure out what to do to minimize that 300 million gallons that was being released into a river that runs right through the heart of Durango and into the Navajo Nation. Is that right? That's correct. And in so doing, you contracted with the private sector to do the construction and remediation work that the professionals felt was appropriate, did you not? That's correct with EPA oversight. And that one of those contractors was you, Mr. Greeny, and your company, true? That's correct. And listening to your testimony, you've done some 1,300 similar kinds of tasks for the EPA, and I think your testimony was 10,000 for other agencies and the private sector. That's, that's yeah. correct. The kind of work you do it can be dangerous. Isn't that true? That's also correct. And it can be complex. That's correct. Can you how would you describe all of the tunnels that you're dealing with uh, in this Silverton complex or the Silverton Mining District when you were working on the Gold King Mine? Well, uh, they're obviously very complex. And so the, the chairman started off his, test, his statement saying, well, would a prudent person undertake this? Well, one prudent person, probably not. But when 300 million gallons a year are coming into a beautiful river, where into a city that prides itself on being very outdoors and very health conscious, should the United States and should the state of Colorado, even though it may not be prudent, try to undertake to fix something like that? Mr. Greeny, what would you say? We, we address many, many task orders on behalf of the US EPA, and all of them have you know, a, a basis for each one. And, and Dr. Williamson, in your experience, does the EPA, does the Division of uh, Mine Land Reclamation in Colorado, do other agencies try to undertake to mitigate against a constant release like this 300 million gallons? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, yes sir, in my experience they do try to offset the sustained discharges. And at some point, my guess is you've been called as an expert witness in a trial or you've advised in the past and hopefully all the things that you've worked on have gone well. But this is a uh, complex and dangerous kind of work, is it not? I would agree that it is, yes. Uh, I thank Mr. Takano for giving me time. I thank all of you for being here. There's no real bad guy. We're trying to fix something that's been 100 years in the making, and we've got a lot of these in Colorado, and we need some help with treatment plants in Silverton. They need it on the Navajo Nation. This is a responsibility that we have as a nation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Molinar, is recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to address these to Mr. Stanislaus. Um, Thank you. I wanted to ask you uh, what lessons uh, that you and the EPA have learned from this incident, this experience. Sure. Um, I mean, so far, you know, uh, 
we, we've identified that we need to enhance the notification process working with the state and local governments. I issued a memo to that regard asking all the regions to work with state and local communities in an event like this which potentially has broad a potential impact. Um, the, the review team also identified uh, that there are a number of things that we could do uh, and, and operationalize going forward. Um, uh, looking at uh, investigating with the private sector potential of uh, remote sensing tools to identify a pressurized situation where it's technically and, and from a safety perspective is really difficult to put a drill pad uh, like it was uh, in this location. Uh, uh, incorporating worst case scenarios in emergency response planning. Uh, so those are some of those um, and some of that's contained in the internal review document, but it's an ongoing lesson learned. I mean, we learn lessons from the thousands of, uh, of sites that we get engaged in around the country. In, in terms of overall cost of, of this, um, someone had mentioned maybe eight million is what has been spent so far. Is that accurate? That is right. It's eight million dollars of the response cost so far. That is correct. And, and do you anticipate additional costs? beyond that? Yeah, I mean, certainly some additional costs. I, I don't know what that estimate is. It is still going to be some ongoing monitoring. It will continue to work with uh, all of the stakeholders on uh, continuing that monitoring and other kinds of, of uh, elements that uh, to accommodate the, the, the stakeholders' uh, requests. And how do you, where do you get the funds for that? Is that from other programs that maybe are of lesser priority that you would shift within the EPA budget? Or how, where would you get that funding? Well, but, well, the budget and all the federal budget is fairly uh, regimented. We have uh, a fixed pot of resources for Superfund, uh, uh, kind of emergency response and removals. And what we do uh, is really prioritize. You know, clearly there are priorities that come up. We need to respond uh, to emergencies and prioritize that as we go forward. You know, it's a it's a tight budget, and we've had declining resources over the years. So it would come out of the Superfund budget uh, projects that. Um, lesser priorities would kind of go to the bottom of that list and, and you would move that to this? Well, yeah, we have a pot of money to, to make ourselves available to respond to emergencies on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, we, we use that pot of money to respond. Okay. And what uh, I, I have not heard, uh, has EPA obviously has taken responsibility for this, but it, has EPA acknowledged mistakes that were made that, um, you know, for instance, there's always this comparison, you know, are you, how would you treat a private actor if they were in this situation? Obviously, you're in the position where you're investigating, um, you were conducting the operations, but then you were also responsible for any penalties. Would you treat a private actor differently than is current, is there a conflict of interest here? Well, we would treat the private actor uh, uh, identically. So, for example, uh, when an incident happens, what we ask, uh, what we uh, demand of the responsible party is to immediately go forward, uh, expend resources, collect data immediately, analyze that data, uh, pr provide uh, water supplies, as an example, uh, and you know we, we would embrace the, the unified command emergency response structure. So that that is identical. Uh, you know, we would demand transparency, and I believe we are identically in transparency. Uh, I would argue more, you know, very forward-leaning on transparency. I mean, in terms of long-term, you know, we, we're still in the midst of investigating. So and I asked for internal review, uh, uh, and the administrator asked for internal review uh, to quickly identify what, was ha what happened here, how should that inform other sites immediately. You know, we also, uh, uh, there's also two other uh, independent investigation, so we should have uh, the, uh, the Department of Interior's investigation done roughly about s what I know is 60 days from the time it started, so, uh, so I'm guessing that's about 40 days or so, uh, and the uh, Office of Inspector General of EPA is also conducting a study. So we're going to, you know, see uh, all of w what is identified there, you know. So again, you know, I have responsibility for the cleanup of contaminant sites around the country, the, you know, and we work with communities to protect public health and safety from the legacy of these sites. You may want to continue to learn those. If there are lessons learned, you know, and if there are ways of holding people accountable, holding ourselves accountable in those documents, we will certainly look at that. Do you, do you think it would be uh, a strong? The gentleman's time has expired. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Molinar. The gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, you know, to the, the people of the communities uh, affected, uh, you know, I, I do 
uh, share uh, in you know my thoughts, my concerns. This this was a tragedy, uh, and to to me it seems like it's inherently dangerous uh, work when you're uh, dealing uh, with mines. It's it's dangerous for the EPA. It's dangerous for the contractors, uh, and it's it's awful when anything uh, like this happens. And you know I don't agree with the name of the uh, hearing, Mr. Chairman, but I, I do agree with the right to have a hearing about something uh, that involves uh, an important. Uh, government agency. In my experience, uh, these types of uh, incidents will take uh, some time to thoroughly uh, be investigated and, uh, you know, hopefully we, we get to the bottom of it. And I think this is a part of that process. Uh, Mr. Stanislaus, I just have a few questions first. Uh, is it contemplated that uh, there could be a breach of contract or litigation brought against the contractor or subcontractors uh, involved is that possible going forward? Well, well, again, we are going to uh, evaluate uh, the two other reports that are coming uh, down, and we're going to have to evaluate more of the specific facts. We have one independent review, uh, and you know it speaks for itself that there was proper planning. The work plan uh, seemed to be uh, executed. There potentially are more that can be done in the future. So that's currently where we are. Sure, and, and Mr. Greeny, that's not a comment one way or the other on your work, but I, I do want to highlight just to my colleagues on the other side that um, it, it does seem that if there is a right of action available against a private actor, uh, that that is something that is possible. Uh, is that right, Mr. Uh, Stanislaus? That is right. And, and then uh, I, I do, with that in mind, uh, I would like to yield the rest of my time. I think it's important uh, for the member who's uh, most closely affected by this to continue to have questions if he wishes. So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the gentleman from Colorado, I'd like to yield to him if possible. Um, and I thank my friend from California. Uh, Mayor Brookie, you did mention the Good Samaritan uh, bill that was proposed by uh, Senators Udall and Bennett and I think Congressman Tipton, um, which I generally support, but in this instance it wouldn't have helped. I mean, we actually were working on a mine and there was a major release. That's correct. So in the in connection with the eight million dollars that the EPA has spent so far, uh, what has been done for the town of Durango, if anything, within with that eight million dollars? Can you tell us? Well, uh, perhaps Mr. Stanislaus could answer that, but I, you know, in, we have submitted, we'll, we'll be uh, next week submitting a, a an invoice to the EPA for direct costs associated with uh, the emergency response, uh, loss of sales of water in our case, uh, and a number of other uh, direct costs to the city of Durango. Obviously, the business community will be submitting uh, via the Form 95s uh, uh, for any loss in their business. That would be the whitewater rafters, uh, hotels, you know, any of the uh, any of the public uh, business, private businesses that would uh, have a, a claim. Uh, for loss of income and loss of business. Okay, uh, Mr. Stanislaus, uh, the $8 million, and I know there was a previous question, uh, what of that $8 million explain the mitigation that took place immediately after the, the release and how, you know, protecting the life and limb of your contractors and of your own personnel and then what you've done to slow down this release? Sure. Um, Immediately after the release, we kind of shored up the situation. We diverted the water so it can be treated. So we have uh, treatment ponds uh, diverting and treating the water. We believe we're capturing about 90 plus percent uh, of the metals in a far better case than described in the video where you're untreated water. Uh, we still have uh, more to do in terms of a long-term solution. That is why I was, in, I was in Silverton having that discussion. So let me ask this question. Uh, in uh, the video that uh, Congressman Buyer showed us there was a discussion of making the Silverton Mining District, or at least these mines, uh, put them on the national priorities list, make them part of a Superfund site. How would that affect your ability to pay for, you know, new treatment plants <laughs> for the area, for the Navajo Nation? Can you explain? Sure. Um, by being listed on the national priorities list, it makes that site eligible for a, a permanent and long-term solution. So in mining sites like this, one of the fundamental things that are done is a permanent water treatment system to handle the volume and really reduce all the contaminants, in this case metals, before it enters into the rivers. Thank you. 
And I thank my friend from California. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Stanislaus, uh, during the spill, President Obama came out and visited the region, but he did not visit the site or meet with those who are affected by the spill. Did the EPA request that President Obama not visit the spill site? Well, all I can tell you is that uh, EPA shifted into emergency response. We had emergency response personnel working on emergency response with local stakeholders. Uh, Administrator McCarthy did visit uh, the area, uh, met with local stakeholders, really want to make sure that the emergency response I is well managed, as, as, uh, as, as I know. Again, I think, as someone mentioned earlier, I think it's ironical uh, that she's not here today either. But let me ask, does it surprise you that President Obama visited the area but did not come to the site or visit with the folks uh, who were affected as the Navajos were? Well, uh, all, all I can tell you is that uh, uh, from, from, from where I sit, you know, we want to make sure that the emergency response is the infrastructure is in place. We did that. The Unified Command had the local government, the states and tribes involved. Uh, Administrator McCarthy did, in fact, visit uh, all the local communities, visit uh, the Navajo while she was there to, to gauge how the response was going and how we could be of assistance. All right, well then uh, let me ask you this, uh, so a, little, a few technicalities. What was the relationship between the EPA and the Environmental Restoration LLC staff on site conducting work at this particular mine? The, what was well, the relationship? Well, they, they are a contractor uh, who, pursuant to a request for proposal, put in place a work plan to deal, to address the work at this site. Uh, EPA oversees the work by the contractor. Okay, do, does, does the EPA specify what exact work will be conducted in each step of the work? Well, uh, it's kind of a, it is a sequential process. So we, we issue a request proposal detailing uh, the particular circumstance we'd like the contractor to address. Uh, we ask the contractor to respond uh, with that, with the work plan, and then there are other uh, additional implementation kind of documents. Well, I, I just, I want to know, it, does the EPA have the final decision-making authority on this site of the Gold Absolutely. Mine? Okay. Uh, did Environmental Restoration LLC ever raise any concerns regarding the work to be conducted at Gold King Mine? We've seen some videos today which kind of alluded to that possibility. Had, had uh, uh, the Environmental Restoration, had, did they uh, ever, ever raise a red flag? What, what I am aware of is uh, we raised the issue of the particular circumstance at the, at the uh, Gold King Mine. We and the state of Colorado, that's the reason why we were there. Uh, uh, and it's uh, to deal with the particular circumstance. The particular circumstance was that there was a cave-in at uh, the Gold King Mine uh, area. There were water seeping from that. Uh, the, the contract was to address that particular uh, situation while also addressing uh, the, the, the mine beneath that, the Rena Bonita mine, uh, as well. So the cave-in was what, was that the exact cause of the spill? Well, again, there's a pre-existing condition, and, you know, going back uh, uh, over a decade or so, uh, initially the state of Colorado uh, worked with the mining operator to deal with the cave-in situation, deal with uh, the water emitting from the complex uh, of mines. Uh, so that, that had been going on for years. Uh, they've addressed some of the cave-in. Uh, we got involved r right around 2014 uh, to deal specifically with uh, the Red and Bonita and the Gold King Mine, developed a plan as, as you all have in front of you. Who, who, were, who, were, who were the folks that were operating the machinery that day? Were they, were they uh, EPA employees or environmental restoration employees? Who were they? Well, there were subcontractors, uh, as Mr. Greeny uh, talked about. Um, I don't have those individuals' names in front of me. But I just want to know who, who they work for. Uh, well, they ultimately work for EPA, absolutely. Okay, they were EPA employees, but they no, were no, no, contractors. No, 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 no. They were contractors, subcontractors to the prime contractor. Not with environmental restoration. Well, there are, you know, in typical jobs like this, you have a prime contract, and, and you bring – a particular expertise, the subcontractor that you're referring to had a particular expertise in mining operations. It's unfortunate, very unfortunate thing to happen, and uh, it brings to mind a, uh, in North Carolina, we had a rancher or a farmer who accidentally spilled some cow manure into a local river and was fined $15,000, which is a lot of money uh, for some folks. 
-hmm. And uh, I'd like to see some, uh, some responsibility shouldered by the EPA here. And I'm very disturbed that it took 24 hours to inform the folks downriver uh, of, of, the, uh, of the, the spill even occurring. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that's... Uh, well, that's uh, again, as I outlined in my opening uh, statement, uh, there was immediate notification between us and the state as set forth in a contingency and in a plan for notification. But I also agree, in an incident like this, uh, we need to have broader notification, us, states, local governments, and tribes, to make sure everyone is aware. All the notification did occur before any of the impacts of the spill reached them. I would imagine if you lived down, downstream, you would have wanted to be no, uh, notified Absolutely. very, very rapidly. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Babin. And the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Stanislaus, uh, there was an article by the Associated Press back on August 20th uh, in which uh, the article says that the EPA is now downplaying the danger of the Colorado mine spill, but uh, concerns linger uh, that the contamination levels are, are pretty serious. Yet the EPA says that uh, the contamination levels were returning to pre-spill pre levels and no longer threatens uh, the rivers. Do you agree with that? Is that the EPA's position? Well, EPA put in place uh, an aggressive data program working with everyone in Unified Command. Unified Command. That includes the state, the tribes, and uh, all the local governments. Uh, we then went through our laboratory process and then compared that to uh, pre-existing levels and made a judgment. Once we achieved uh, pre-existing levels, uh, we communicated that in unified command, and then the local governments made a decision about reopening the river. Mm -hmm. um, the AP article also said that they made repeated requests to the EPA for information on pre-spill contamination. Uh, so that they obviously could compare that to the current contamination levels. Uh, at the time of the article, the EPA uh, had failed to respond to that request. Has the EPA provided that information? Yeah, it is on our website where we have uh, tables and graphs and the actual data that compares uh, the data taken on various days uh, to pre-spill conditions and other parameters. So was was it on your website at um, around August 15th to 20th time frame? Was it there then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have the article in front of me. I don't know what particular time frame they were talking about. The article so, was on August 20th. Yeah, but as soon as we could collect and process uh, the data, we posted it on our website. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly there is a, a laboratory process, particularly with metals. Uh, it takes the time to analyze that, but as soon as uh, we had that data available, uh, we not only posted on our press, but more immediately we communicated with uh, state and local and tribal officials. Okay. Are, are you satisfied with the levels of contamination of arsenic and lead and other contaminants uh, that are currently in the river? Um, is that consistent with what you require uh, from private companies in terms of wastewater discharge? Well, what we addressed was whether uh, the river has been restored to pre-spill uh, pre condition. However, now, the Animus River Stakeholder Group and others here in Colorado had long recognized that there was a whole load of contaminants going into the river, and that is the reason why I was in Silverton just last week at the request of local communities to examine the possibility mm -hmm. of a long-term solution uh, through a super fund, a potential listing. But. Um You've approved it for recreational use again, and uh, based on your uh, analysis of, of the contaminants in the river, yet other health agencies have advised people not to drink the water and not to basically come in contact with, with the soil. Uh, that seems to me to be inconsistent with uh, uh, a, a water source being ready for recreational use. I mean, here's the problem I've got with this, and and I, you know, I, the EPA plays an important role, and I've I've been a, a vocal critic of of the EPA. My problem with this is there appears to be a double standard. It's been mentioned several times here. Uh, if this had been a private company, uh, I don't think the EPA would share the same optimism 
uh, if this had, had, had been a private company. Uh, I don't think the EPA would have would, would have handled them uh, the same way they've uh, the EPA has handled itself uh, in in regard to uh, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Johnson's video and 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 the uh, obvious alterations to the video. Uh, I, I think there's it's problematic that the EPA is 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 um, not doing the due diligence and in investigating this analyst the way they would if it were a private company. I mean, um, uh, Mr. Babin mentioned a, a, a rancher in Texas. There's a, a guy, I think, uh, in Wyoming who, who built a pond, and, and they're finding him, what, $35,000, $37,000 a day. I just don't see, uh, I see a real problem here uh, with the way EPA handles this, and, and everything's fine, look the other way, there's nothing going on here, but you wouldn't do the same thing if it were a private company. You, you would destroy the company. Well, all I can say is that from a transparency, taking responsibility for this bill, we've done. I mean, uh, you know, EPA is involved in thousands of contaminated sites around the country. I take that responsibility very seriously. I want to make sure, because communities and states ask us to be involved because of the public health and environmental dimension of that problem. I want to make sure that work is done, because ultimately, I think we all want to uh, address the conditions that uh, resulted in looking at asking us to p provide assistance. So uh, I am right. committed to learning the lessons as, uh, from this site as well as others. That's what we all want. That's what we want for Durango. That's what we want for the Navajo Nation. That's what we want in every community in the country, every municipality that is under an enormous burden imposed by the EPA. And it appears to me, Mr. Chairman, that there is a double standard. Uh, I've gone over my time. I yield the balance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. And the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Ben, the EPA uh, triggered a spill that has done damage to the Navajo Nation. Uh, they then took the lead uh, in, in the aftermath of, of the spill, and now they are investigating themselves. This seems like a clear conflict of interest. Uh, does this concern you? Yes, it is a, a clear um, conflict of interest. And we have um, approached um, uh, officials about trying to figure out uh, if we can actually uh, have somebody appointed uh, other than the EPA to do the investigation. Do you believe the, that the EPA will hold itself accountable? Uh, earlier we, we saw a video from uh, Representative Bill uh, um, Bill Johnson from Ohio, he had a video, and it, it indicated that uh, maybe the EPA might not be totally forthright about how they're presenting themselves in this matter. Um, d I mean, is this, is this of concern uh, that, that maybe uh, the damages might not all be prevalent because they're investigating themselves? Well, we, um, just to um, be clear about how they uh, communicated information to us from the beginning, it was, um, uh, it wasn't until 24 hours later that they uh, let us know, let us knew what happened. And at the same time, um, when, um, when, when they did let us know, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't really uh, them that uh, told us about what happened. It was actually the state of New Mexico that approached us and told us about all this information. It, 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 it appears Cynthia Kaufman, Colorado's Attorney General, called for a non-federal independent review of this matter. Is that correct? Are you aware of that? No, I'm not aware of that. Well, that, uh, that it indicates that that's her intention. In your testimony, you state that the EPA Region 9 tour guide was with you on your site visit. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You further stated that it appeared during your visit to the mine site that it was the first time an EPA Region 9 official had visited the location. Is that to your recollection? When, yes, when we were, we were actually one of the first ones up there. Um, there wasn't uh, too many other uh, jurisdictions that had access to it. We, we kind of, um, you know, bogarted away our way up there. And uh, because, because EPA told us that the water was clear, Right, and we wanted to make sure. And when we got up there, obviously it wasn't. Well, that's what my next uh, question here. You noted that yellow water was still exiting the mine at it at the time of your visit. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what you saw in regards to the the water still exiting the mine? 
it was still mustard uh, orange, and we did see where they had put in the ponds, and then we saw how they were treating it with uh, sodium hydroxide and uh, um, uh, a flocculant actually that uh, captures the metals that, and we saw that uh, on the day that we were up there. And this was all coming from the mine at it at the time? Yes, sir. Uh, this is a, a question for my good friend from New Mexico, Steve Pierce. Um, he says that in New Mexico, about 60% of the total surface water is in this watershed. The Navajo Nation is at ground zero as well. Uh, Mr. Stanislaus, is the, is, is the problem going to be cleaned up in, in New Mexico? Is it now? Is it going to be cleaned up? Yeah, so we have worked with the, the state of New Mexico uh, and uh, other states and the Navajo Nation. So we provided data, and uh, we've, we've concluded the data has uh, uh, shown that it's been restored to pre-incident uh, conditions. You know, But there is a long-term solution. Uh, there's lots of discussions by stakeholder groups uh, about potential uh, of Superfund or other vehicles. So as I uh, identified in my opening uh, statement, uh, there is a, a load from mine, a lot of mines, about 330 million gallons per year, uh, and the Animus uh, River stakeholders have identified that concern as well as the state of Colorado as something, as they're in need for a long-term solution. So can my friend Steve Pierce from New Mexico go home and tell his constituents that the drinking water is safe? Can he do that in good conscience right now? Yes, I mean, what we've communicated uh, with the state of Colorado, I'm sorry, with the state of New Mexico, uh, is that the water has returned to pre-incident conditions. Roger, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bryden, Mr. Ein. Uh, we have no other members with questions, so let me thank all of our expert witnesses today for their testimony. Uh, this has been a very informative hearing, and I think you've heard from members on both sides of the aisle of their uh, keen interest in the EPA uh, cleaning up the problem, making sure that it doesn't happen again, and uh, looking forward to the conclusion of the investigation because we do want someone to be held accountable and we want the EPA to take responsibility. Uh, thank you all, and we are adjourned.